I'm Mark Mazar, I'm the director of the Institute, and you're all very, very welcome. And this is the second in our series of Les Rendezvous de l'Institut, uh, which, as some of you may know, is the keynote series of our intellectual activity in which each of the fellows who's at the Institute uh, talks about what they're working on. Um, and before we get into tonight's, I just want to let you know that there is a a program at the back of the entire year's uh, rendezvous, and that we've had a switch between Ralph Gotchi and Bukha Khalili at the end of November and the beginning of December, for those of you who are aficionados. I just wanted to point <laughs> that out. Um, okay, so it's a great pleasure to welcome Dina Nayari, who is a uh, 2019-20 Abigail R. Cohen Fellow at the Institute, and I think... Uh, really one of the few essential writers today writing on the refugee experience. And that's partly because she speaks from experience. And uh, Dina was born in 1979 in Isfahan uh, in Iran. And at the age of eight, uh, she fled uh, Iran with her mother and her young brother, her mother, had converted to Christianity. And uh, after a period spent in Dubai and then outside Rome, uh, she ended up in Oklahoma. <laughs> and sort of became an American girl uh, uh, and uh, went to Princeton. Um, thanks partly to Taekwondo, as some of you will know if you've read her works. Uh, and then she went to Harvard and, uh, amongst other things, got an MBA, which I suspect is going to feature as tangentially in today's talk. Uh, so partly because of her own experience, but partly also because of, of her extraordinary gifts as a writer and as somebody who's engaged, I think, very deeply intellectually and emotionally with the experience of being a refugee. Her, her short stories and her essays have been very, very widely published, and I'm going to miss some of them out. New York Times, The New Yorker, The Wall Street Journal, The Atlantic, uh, Grant Her New Voices, <coughs> The Guardian. She was the winner of 2018 Paul Engel Prize that's given by the University of Iowa Writers' Workshop, of which she's an alumna. I, I think that sounds to have been a, an important experience for her in making the transition, if it was a transition, to becoming a writer. And she started with two novels, 2013 and Teaspoon of Earth and Sea, uh, and then 2017 Refuge. And then something happened, maybe we can find out what, but it seems to me that the voice and the approach changed, and there were two uh, more or less first-person, uh, very important first-person essays that appeared in 2017, the, the Ungrateful Refugee. Well, that's not a first-person essay, but that's not the work of a novelist either exactly, in The Guardian, which became one of the most read, long-read items in The Guardian, and a very, very moving piece about her relationship with her father, more specifically her father's visits, very occasional visits, uh, to see her over 30 years that appeared in The New Yorker. And then this year, Canongate published, I think, really, really very remarkable book that I hope you will all read and buy once the copies arrive, The Ungrateful Refugee. Uh, and I don't want to say a lot about this because we want to hear from Dina, but I think that well, I was thinking about this. I think one of the difficulties if you write about refugees is, is refugee fatigue as a kind of narrative problem, that people have heard these dreadful stories many, many times. And so uh, it takes a rare writer to, to draw you in. And uh, um, Dina does something very interesting, I think, in The Ungrateful Refugee, which is by interweaving her own story with the story of uh, more recent refugees who she had come across and interviewed and got to, to know, she, she gets involved, uh, well, it, it sounds very, the sort of phenomenology of being a refugee, uh, uh, what, what, what it is to exist in this psychological, emotional space, uh, and in particular, and I think this is where her, her writer's instinct came in, what it is to be somebody who, whose life depends on the stories that you tell. And suddenly, the question of how you tell stories 
is not just a kind of nice literary problem, but actually it's a matter of death about whether your stories turn out to be the kinds of stories that the person who's in interrogating you wants to hear. Uh, and that, I suspect, is what brings us to the subject of tonight's talk, Problem Stories, When the Truth is Not Enough. And with that, I shall be quiet, and I shall hand over to Dean. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for that incredible introduction, Mark. That's so kind. Can you see me? I'm very short. <laughs> I'm going to take this microphone here and maybe roam a little bit, but um, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be here in Paris and a great honor to be part of the Columbia Institute for Ideas and Imagination and to have this chunk of time to work on my next book. Um, as Mark said, um, this next work does come out of my last one, which was pretty much, you know, I guess precisely what his, he said. It was this pivot. It was a moment where I decided to go from fiction to nonfiction and to tell my own story and to kind of come out from behind that veil. So first I want to just go back a little bit and tell you a little bit about me and how I came to write these stories and then I'll get into a little bit of reading, yeah? So today I guess what I want to talk to you about is truth, truth and lies and when stories just aren't enough. So. This is my family. When, um, you know, I was born in 1979 in Iran, but I think one thing that became more and more important to me as I grew older is that I was born to a family who was trusted and believed and was respectable. I was born to a family of doctors in, in Iran, um, just at the moment of the revolution. So that's my mother and father a week after they were married and they're having a picnic in an old village where um, my father grew up and where all of his family um, had lived for you know, generations and generations. Most of them were in the medical practice. That's my father with his parents and that's, that's Nehru coming to visit our village <laughs> and meet my ancestors. Um, the village boasts the oldest two-story aqueduct in, in the world. Um, so for that reason, it has a little bit of um, a little bit of a fame, and that's my passport photo from when we left Iran. Now, as Mark said, we became refugees uh, because my mother converted to Christianity, and um, my mother, brother, and I spent some time in a refugee camp. This is the refugee camp. Those are the children of the camp. Um, those are some of the people from. Um, you know, various Eastern European countries and Afghanistan and Iraq. There was a lot of Russians, people from Poland and Romania. Um, and then that's my mother with some of the, um, the other refugees from Afghanistan. We spend a lot of time there. And I think one of the, the first person who really noticed this, this notion that suddenly we went from being trusted people to ones who weren't so trusted was my mother, of course, because she had fallen so far in society. Um, she had gone from being a doctor and the wife of a doctor to just being some unknown refugee who had to sell her story to another country in order for her and her children to be saved. So this, you know, I spent all of these decades processing um, uh, through fiction and layering my own stories, I suppose, with my imagination and trying to, I suppose, in some ways, connect, uh, protect myself. Um, and then this past couple of years with the writing of The Ungrateful Refugee, I decided to actually go back. And I decided to reimmerse myself in um, the life of some refugees and to get their stories and to write them alongside my own and to see what's changed and, to what, and what's stayed the same. So these are photos from a refugee camp that I visited in 2017. Um, it, it's in Katsakas, right um, outside of uh, um, Ioannina in Greece. Um, these are the shipping crates where people live and these are some of the children. Those are the women making pasta. Uh, look, they're putting the pasta on the bed frame to dry. Um, and uh, while I was at this camp, I really had a chance to think about um, how we tell our stories to each other, how we share them. Um, most of the people there were so forthcoming with their stories. They were so generous with me. They were just ready with a cup of tea and to, to talk for hours and hours, and I hadn't expected that. But I also hadn't expected the way they told their stories. Um, the way they told their stories were so visceral, so you know, rooted in the five senses. Um, it's so familiar in all of the ways that we told stories um, when I was a child in Iran. And they also told their stories through art. And in this talk, I'll explore why I think that is. That is a plate that I, I, I found in the camp. It's, um, it was painted by one of the residents. And of course, as you can see, it's, it's, a, it's a dinghy on the water with all of the people in the night. Um, and those are the children. 
So um, as I was writing this book, this, the question that kept coming back to me again and again is why are some people so easily believed and why are some people so easily dismissed? Whose stories do we believe? Um, I devoted a chapter of the book to... Um, I devoted a chapter of the book to um, asylum and how asylum seekers, you know, try to convince people that their stories are true. Um, and then I thought a lot about storytelling and what I've learned about it over the years. So I'm going to read a little piece to you um, from my book. And this is pretty much what uh, launched me into the research that I'm going to do this year, which will just be exclusively about being believed in storytelling. <clears throat> Twice in my life, I've been instructed to tell a story that, if believed, would open the door to a new life, a chance to remake myself. Children know instinctively how to tell good stories, especially true ones. And so my asylum interview wasn't the burden it is for adults. I didn't agonize over it. It didn't tickle the itchy spots in my neck and palms. The interview didn't make them worse. I hardly remember it now. I know we were interviewed in spring 1989 in the American Embassy in Rome, traveling there by bus from our refugee hostel in Montana. I know I had not yet turned 10. My second petition for a new life was at the Iowa Writers' Workshop after I left Amsterdam and started over as a writer. Again, I had landed in middle America with its white porch swings and hot summer nights. My disorientation was so similar to those first Oklahoma days. I dragged my body. I have exile sickness, I said to no one, and tried to hold in all the ticks. On the crisp autumn afternoon when my novel was first workshop, I was consumed with fear that I had told lies. Of course I had lied. I had written a novel. A running joke in workshops is this. A novice submits a story, and it falls flat. It isn't believable. In defense of his story, he shouts, but it happened. Too bad, our teachers say. That's why the novelist has a tougher job than God. God. God can have coincidences and melodrama and silly pointless scenes that don't move the story forward. That it doesn't make, oh, sorry, that, that it happened doesn't make it true enough for fiction. And like the asylum seeker who isn't believed, novels that are seen to lie are doomed to death. What makes a story true, we would ask in seminars and workshops. There were many answers, vulnerability, a singular, unashamed voice, surprising inevit inevitability, originality. Orphan details, Charles Baxter told us once, bring a story to life. These details are specific and strange, and they seem not to belong. A naked woman wandering in the rain. A child gnawing on a chicken bone on a bench. Our, pro or our, our protagonists pass by them, sometimes reflecting on them, sometimes not. They are part of the world. In How Fiction Works, James Wood asks, how do we know when a detail is really true? What guides us? The medieval theologian Duns Scotus gave the name thisness. Um, I'm going to try to pronounce this. Hexatus? Hexatus, to individuating form. Because thisness is palpability. It will tend towards substance. Cow shit, red silk, the wax of a ballroom floor, a calendar for 1808. But it can be a mere name or an anecdote. Palpability can be represented in the form of an anecdote or a piquant fact. Recalling our community of exiles in Oklahoma, I scribbled in my notebook, Korean ribs on basmati rice. What makes a story important, we'd ask. This seemed more urgent. In a seminar, in a seminar called Undoings, Charles Baxter told us that the stories worth telling are the ones in which someone's world tilts on its axis and they are forever changed. There is no undoing what's been done. He told us to aim for stories that, though they cover a day or a week of a life, allow the reader to imagine everything that came before and everything that comes after. Most lifetimes only have a handful of stories like that. You must slice out a wedge from the arc of a life. The wedge is that life's most vital story. The consequence of choosing the wrong wedge is that your story strikes false. In 2012, I started writing the kind of stories Baxter told us would strike true. Moments of undoing, however subtle. I populated these with the orphan details I knew, the ones from my home, my family. I stayed close to stories I had lived, but used the tools of fiction, combining characters, collapsing time, inserting invented images. 
It was, I believe, the purest, most powerful way to tell honest stories. Autofiction removes any impediment to vulnerability so that the writer can focus on creating a fresh, compelling voice and a moving narrative. At the same time, it stays close to the raw story that only a single person can know. It skirts all the randomness and irrelevance of nonfiction, and yet, in con and yet it contains all the power of a re lived reality. It is a chance to rewrite the facts in service of a larger truth. My mother, on the other hand, believes, the f believes in facts as they happened, one universal, irrefutable reality. She is brutal in questioning new refugees. Sometimes she embarrasses me. She thinks that if something is true, we should all remember it the same way. If we don't, someone is mistaken or lying. She has a mathematical mind, a scientific mind, with no patience for narrative fancies. The psyche is too mysterious and insufficient to reliably link them with facts. So, when I pick and choose from her traits for my fiction, she believes that I'm writing about her, the real her, and that I owe my invented story the perfect truth of who she is. Is this what you learned in writing school, she said once? You lied. It wasn't real, it's fiction, I said. Yes, but it was still full of lies, she said. My mother and I have been having the same argument for years. She keeps saying that the facts are sacred. I keep saying that they're a tool, that truth requires point of view as well. It needs to be cobbled from the facts. I wonder what our world would look like if refugees were asked, instead of reciting facts, to write a story that shows their truth in another way. What if those stories were then evaluated by professional editors using the same skills they use to see if novels are true enough? It is a fantasy, but I decide to try it. In 2017, I joined Singa UK to launch a refugee st storytelling workshop. For our first session, we sit around a big table at Libraria Bookshop in London and struggle for two hours. Half the class demurs. The other half doesn't speak English. Why are they here? I keep thinking of a story from my cousin Puyan's wife, a visual artist and a fellow Iranian. She gave an Afghani boy pencils and asked him to draw. He drew SpongeBob. He drew a truck. He drew a crane with spidery arms, two men's ha men hanging from it with crosses for their eyes. Then he drew another SpongeBob. I want to ask everyone in my class to draw a crane, the way in beginning writing workshops you are asked to describe a barn. Maybe the new arrivals sitting around my table at Libraria are tired of crafting their one story according to other people's rules. Maybe they've had enough MFA training Maybe they want to create something different now or to finally their, tell their true story truly, raw and full of dirty details in the authentic storytelling language of their youth. Because to pass an asylum interview, you don't just need a true story. You need to tell that story the English way or the Dutch way or the American way. Americans enjoy drama. They want to be moved. The Dutch want facts. The English have precedents, stories from each country deemed true that year, that month. The, the Dutch have something similar. Americans like the possibility of a grand success story. They adore exceptionalism, and they want to make all greatness American. I'll, I'll stop there, and then I'm going to read another little bit about a man that I met and a very, very strange lunch that I had outside of Amsterdam with a group of um, undocumented immigrants, but also some who had been there for a long time and already were starting to become Dutch. So there was kind of an older group, along with the restaurant owner who had, I had gone to visit, and then this one man <clears throat> named Hushyar. I meet Hushyar, a day, I meet Hushyar, a day worker for a local Iranian businessman at Parviz's restaurant. After two rejections, Hushyar has given up on Dutch asylum. He lives illegally at a camp sneaking in to bunk with friends. About an hour into my conversation with Hushyar, I realize I'm missing a vital chunk of the truth. There is something here that is perhaps hidden from me. We're talking about Hushyar's faith, the day he became a Christian, and his struggle to be believed. But somehow, I sense that I have the wrong wedge. This man has a story, but I'm not hearing it. Hushyar wears a leather jacket and skinny jeans. He's young, modern, except for all the hair gel. He shows me photos of his beautiful son, a boy styled to look like a European adult from the late 90s. 
Every photo is a studio shot. He shows me his unhappy wife. He says he converted because the boy was gravely ill and in the hospital, a Christian man prayed with him. His boy was set to die, but when he recovered, Hushiar believed. The more he speaks, the more I crave the real story. It isn't that I don't believe the one he's offering. I just know he has a better, more fundamental one. What compelled him to drop everything and run? The door, chime, the door chimes announced three new visitors, a well-dressed Iranian Dutch couple in their early 60s and a man around Parviz's age. He is Hushyar's employer, the one who gives him odd jobs. Parviz instructs his cook to make some omelets and eggplant whey for us. We sit around a long table and, and take turn, uh, oh, talk turns to, wait, what am I saying? Oh, sorry. We sit around a long table and the talk turns to Hushyar's latest asylum rejection. They said I didn't, I didn't explain my apostasy from Islam well enough. Hushyar shrugs, sighs, then tells us that his mother is sick. The employer shakes his head and, drop, um, and drops his bread on the table. Listen, son, when you fall into the water, no one will save you but you. In that interview, you have to shut the world out. Focus. Pre pretend you're in the sea. The husband is nodding a lot. He leans in. Look, here's a small piece of advice for you. Whatever lie you tell, you must first convince yourself. Give the story branches and leaves. You are the first who must believe. There's a bit of chatter. Then Hushyar says, I don't understand. I told them. Islam is war. They say we have no problem with your Christianity. We just don't believe your apostasy. But isn't conversion by definition apostasy from the former religion? I pose this to the table. You have to prove it, two of them say at once. Casual converts don't present like church leaders. They're not loud and feverish with devotion, and they live in a mixed up culture. The Iranian and the Western all jumbled together. They celebrate Christmas with saffron pudding. They make pilgrimages on Easter and Ascension. Out of habit, they mutter to Muslim prophets as they haul the ti their tired bodies off the ground. These are their specific moving contradictions, the natural flaws that bring a story to life. This lunch has become a perverse workshop. Rejected asylum seekers are always re refining their story, asking for advice. Eventually, they deplete it of joy and meaning, the orphan details that embed in memories. Remember, your audience is listening for contradiction, any contradiction, and life is full of those. A moving detail that can get you rejected. So forget about meaning. Meaning will hurt you. Complexity is compromising. About two hours into the lunch, the wife starts casting meaning meaningful glances at me. Her, her glance flits back and forth between me and Hushyar, and suddenly I know that everyone except Hushyar is thinking the same thing. We know the missing part of his story, the wedge, the thing he's keeping from us and from the asylum officers, and perhaps the reason he's rejected. But we can't just blurt out this question. We need to say it without violating Iranian social rules. We need to cloak it in a second meaning. Your case is important, says the husband. He speaks cautiously, choosing each word. You can convince them even if you're lying, that your story is true, that even if you're lying is pointed and merciful. He wants Hushyar to know that this suggested story doesn't have to be the truth, that we don't believe that about him. The table hushes. We can't be certain, but somehow silently we've agreed that this is a much more vital wedge of Hushyar, Hushyar's story than his conversion. What strange collusion. Outwardly, we're telling this man to lie. Really, we're urging him to be honest with himself, to accept his truth and be at peace. Lie to them, not to yourself. Whatever you say, says the husband, tiptoeing closer to the point, the guy will smile and doubt you. There was a time they would give fast answers. Back when the students were getting killed, the Dutch answered fast. Then there were some programs on television about gays back home. After that, every Iranian was gay. So many got their papers. I hold my breath and watch Hushar's face. He seems unmoved. The wife and I keep glancing at each other. She touches her face. We can't just tell a closeted married Iranian man that he needs to face his sexuality. I know that it's wrong. We could traumatize him. And how can we even be sure? We only know that he is much more convincing as a gay man than as a convert. And that is probably because it's true. We say, gay is a better case. 
or it's useful to be gay, when what we mean is it's okay, you are allowed to be you. We want to tell Hushyar that Iran is long behind him and that he can have an open life here in this hamlet of scattered countrymen. Just tell them the fucking truth we want to say. But instead we say, just tell this more convincing lie. I've seen it, says Hushyar. Many young people out of Iran give a gay case and then every day they go to church. Why shouldn't they, says Parviz? You can be Christian and gay. Hushyar sits up. His voice is disdainful and angry. What does a gay person know about religion and faith? It's the first time he's raised his voice and a current of alarm passes between the rest of us. Oh, come now, says the wife. She's tearing her napkin into strips. Hushyar has been raised on this homophobia for three decades. We can't convince him in a single lunch that an accepting society exists. Your Christianity is nothing, says Pravis. Prove that your life is in danger. Everyone nods. Whether Hushyar is Christian or gay, his life is indeed in danger. Now Parviz grows bolder. Bring your pastor here and ask him. Ask him if you can still be a Christian. Do you want me to call him? Let me say to him that a gay man wants to come to his church. Let's see what he says. The wife shreds another napkin. Whatever your case, says the husband, you must throw yourself in it, drown in it. You must believe. For three hours, we drag this sideways conversation along. We argue, we step out for smokes, we bring out more eggplant. Lunch takes another bizarre turn where Parviz actually telephones the pastor. Hushar grumbles, please leave the man alone. Parviz explains with great care. Our friend is not gay himself, of course. He's one of the new Christians. He just wants to prove to us that you can't be both. Hushar drops his face into his hands. Shame keeps many true stories hidden. What matters is that this man is in danger. Whether he applies with one story or the other, the essential truth is this. His life in Iran would be entirely in the shadows until the day he crosses paths with the wrong person and then he might be hanged. That would be his life. The truest thing is that he needs and deserves asylum. I'll stop there. <clears throat> so um, I like that story just because it was so... Um, so terrible and so complicated and so impossible to get out of. I mean, in that, that lunch lasted in the end for about five hours and none of us knew what to say. Nobody left feeling good. Um, and he didn't change his case and he didn't win asylum and he's still um, undocumented. But um, I'll just use that as a jumping off point into why refugees often don't get believed. Um, I'm now writing a much more reported piece about the entire immigration process in the UK, in the US, and, and across Europe. And one of the first things I want to talk to you about is the number one reason that refugees get turned away is that they don't understand what a refugee is. And so they come in and immediately con uh, commit to the wrong story. I spoke to this man, Ahilan Arunalatham, who is um, a MacArthur Fellow and Senior Counsel at ACLU Southern California. And the first thing he said to me is, take the classic Central American example. And that is this. You have a family of runaways from Central America. You know, they've left Honduras or El Salvador or somewhere where they're in great danger, and they come to the US border. And very, very quickly, they're given a credible fear test to see whether or not, you know, their lives are in danger and for the right reasons. Um, they're asked what happened. Let's say they say that, well, there was a gang. These countries are riddled with gang violence. Um, the gang came and they asked um, for money. And I said no. And of course, I ran away because they said that if you don't pay, you're going to get killed. So then the asylum officer says, why didn't you just pay the gang, right? So there's probably a lot of complex reasons why you didn't pay the gang. Um, the easiest one, though, is, well, what do you think the easiest one is? What is the easiest reason to tell someone, why didn't you pay that guy? No yeah, no money, I don't have the money. And it's true in almost 100% of the cases, right? But if you say that you, just, you didn't have the money and that was your primary reason, then you are not a refugee, you're an economic migrant because a refugee has a very, very specific definition. The 1951 Refugee Convention, or otherwise known as the Geneva Convention, um, basically set the definition of a refugee. A refugee is a person who has been forced to flee and can't return safely home because of a credible fear of future persecution based on one of five things, race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership in a social group. So let's say that you say, instead of, I didn't have enough money, if you say, um, 
where's the other microphone? I'm kind of, I can't see you guys. Let's say instead that you say, I don't believe gangs should be running my country, you know? Then is that a reason for asylum? Yes, a good lawyer can spin that into a good asylum case because that is a political opinion. It is a political opinion that you shouldn't have to pay that gang member. But who's gonna say that? Who has the self-knowledge to go deep into that part of it? Instead, they'll say, I didn't have money. So a lot of cases get turned away simply because the refugees don't have the resources to say the right thing. And once they say something, they're committed to that. Um, one thing I want to note is that the refugee convention where this definition was set happened right after the Holocaust, right? So what do you think people were thinking when they put in that membership in a social group category? So they were thinking about the Jews, right? They were thinking about all the people who ended up in concentration camps because they were in a particular social group. They meant that to include everything else. I personally, after much reading, I'm sure of it. I'm sure that they meant that to be and anyone else who's in danger because of who they are. But more and more, governments have been using that last category to narrow the definition of a refugee. In America, for example, Jeff Sessions is constantly, or was constantly saying, um, you know, well, this group it doesn't count as a social group on its own. For example, battered women aren't a social group because um, they are not bound as a social group by that particular quality before they use that quality as, do you know what I mean? Like Jewish people were Jewish before they were persecuted for being Jewish, right? But you weren't in the group of battered women before you became battered, isn't that insane? Um, <laughs> yes. So basically, um, you know, that last category has been narrowing. So once you have the right story, which is almost always if you have a lawyer, um, then you have to be believed. I um, recently started working with Freedom From Torture, which is a uh, charity in England that helps torture survivors um, come to terms with their story, but also to petition the government for better laws and also to be, have their stories believed. And they collected a set of reasons why um, torture survivors were rejected. And actually, and they collated them into this wonderful report, but some of these letters, these are all from real letters, are absolutely, um, I mean, I don't even know the word. I mean, just read them for yourself. We find it unlikely that a 50-year-old woman would be raped. We find it unlikely that there were four men in the room and only three raped you. If it were accepted that your injuries were so severe that it was believed you would die, then it is inconsistent that these injuries would permit you to escape detention by jumping over a wall. Or it's considered to be inconsistent that you claim that your father was associated with the Taliban, but you did not like them. So a, a teenage boy was rejected with that in his letter. So um, this is a, basically a group that, even if you have the right story, are looking to disbelieve. They're looking for any single inconsistency. Um, although, I talked to a lawyer who said that she's never lost on credibility, again proving that the, those who can afford a lawyer are in the best position. Um, of course, these stories make it all the way back uh, to the refugees themselves as they're escaping. This is a quote from Asso who said, I knew this from the beginning when I was inside the lorry thinking about truth. If you are a good storyteller, you will be trusted. You will get a life and escape from hell. But what do you need to do to be trusted if telling the truth is not enough? Okay, so I want to tell you a story. Uh, before I tell you this, let me just say that this is kind of what my next project is. Um, what I want to do is not talk so much about what truth is or go into all of the, um, you know, like the, the definitions and the analysis and the reflections that I've done in this last book. I just want to find eight to ten astonishing stories about being believed or disbelieved. I, I want to find the kind of stories that will make you question um, all of these things for yourselves. And I found the first one, and it's this next one. So it's about a thing, um, well, before I tell you what SIBP is, um, it's about a man from Sri Lanka. Now, in Sri Lanka, it, there's extensive evidence that torture by the state forces occurs. So in 2009, when this man was, um, you know, supposedly getting tortured, um, it was happening across the country by police and military, and it was well documented and reported in the West. Um, often, 
these survivors um, were burned with soldiering irons and, and they were suspended and detained by their thumbs and all of that. They, they did a lot of other bad things too, but most of the refugees that would come into the UK would be basically showing scarring like the ones you see in the photos to various degrees of, I guess, severity. So, um, well, actually, so let me tell you about this man. So this man, is a, his, 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 he goes by the name KV because his identity isn't really known. Um, but he was suspected of being a Tamil tiger. What he said that he did is that his father was a jeweler, and he and his father had helped the Tamil tigers by melting down jewelry for them and help, help, helping them hide some of their wealth. So the police had arrested him, and he had been severely tortured. Somehow, somebody on the outside had helped him escape. He'd, go, he'd come to the UK and immediately, um, immediately presented himself for asylum. The scars had a very interesting pattern. On his arm, he had some very blurry scars. Um, they weren't clear lines. On his back, he had some very, very distinct um, hot iron scars. Um, they were obviously rods and they were very, very clean. He said that he had been tortured on his arms um, until he passed out. And while he was passed out, the iron was clearly apply cleanly applied to his back so that those marks were very straight and distinctive. He was taken to medical professionals who all said that the story makes sense, that all of the scarring is per per perfectly consistent with the timing and with the actual you know, timeline of the story. So he went into the um, um, asylum office and he gave his case and somebody brought up this thing called SIBP, which is kind of an invented category. It means self-inflicted by proxy. This is the theory that and it's applied to a lot of people from Sri Lanka, that you applied the irons to yourself or you paid a medical professional to put you under anesthesia and then give you those scars so that you would get asylum to the UK. The idea was, one, that UK asylum is so valuable that people would be willing to do this to themselves, and two, um, that a medical professional would be willing to break their ethics and do this, right? But really the biggest thing that they were saying is, we're not really sure this is torture, so let's imagine another thing that it could be, right? Here's another category that it can be. If we can't be 100% sure that it is this, then we can say this is a possibility and actually write that on the rejection letters. So KV went to court. In, in the first, uh, the, the, the first court case that he has, of course, he lost, he was rejected. It went to an upper tribunal, and even the upper tribunal rejected his case. And here's what they said. They said, in relation to the medical evidence, it left us with only two that were real possibilities. That the appellant was tortured as claimed, that his scarring was SIBP. So one or the other, right? Of these two real possibilities, we have found on analysis that the former claim does not, stand with, does not withstand scrutiny. Certainly, we cannot say in his case that the evidence inexorably points to SIBP, but given that we have concluded that it is left as the only real possibility that we have not been able to discount, taking the evidence as a whole, we are satisfied that he has not shown his account as reasonably likely to be true. So what they said is, we don't know if he did it himself, but we definitely haven't proved with 100% certainty that he didn't, and so we're just gonna say that. And so we find that at no stage, um, then or thereafter, did he come to the adverse attention of the army, etc. So obviously this case went to the Supreme Court because this is a, an absurd break in logic. Um, there was a, a couple of other things that happened in this case that were actually um, quite phenomenal. One of them was that um, they mistook one of the doctor's testimony and they wrote it sort of as the very opposite of what the doctor said. I won't say very deep, I won't go very deeply into that, but they wouldn't then take the doctor's word that he never said that. They took the upper tribunal's word that the way they recorded it was the truth. So in the Supreme Court, uh, basically, uh, they said you can't create a catch-all bucket. So if your inquiry into the disputed circumstances say that there's only two real possibilities and then you reject one of them, you're necessarily concluding 
that the other one is what happened. You are saying this. On the other hand, you actually have have put that possibility to zero scrutiny, right? Because we know that there's extensive torture by state forces in Sri Lanka in 2009, but evidence of wounding by SBI IBP on the part of the asylum seeker is almost non-existent. So the Supreme Court said, you can't do this. And then they sent the whole case back to the Home Office to review again. So I'm going to talk to him and his lawyer as part of this project and see what happened. But the astonishing part of this is that it took all the way to the Supreme Court for anyone to say, wait a minute, the, the Home Office is creating you know, this logical absurdity, this way of saying we are going to apply a standard of proof of 100%, even beyond, beyond reasonable doubt to asylum seekers who've been tortured. Um, I'll skip over this one, but this is basically one of the dissents fr from within the tribunal that says, um, I can't possibly believe that anyone would be willing to go under this, um, would, would go through this to do this kind of self-harm, even under anesthesia, and also, why would a medical professional be willing to do this? And the Supreme Court says that that should also be our view. So, let me look at the clock. <laughs> so why are refugees so hard to believe? So that was kind of the next question that I, I've been looking into recently. Um, obviously there is the fact that the definition is very, very specific, getting more and more narrow, and these are not people who have access to a lot of sophisticated, um, you know, like analysis of this stuff, they don't have access to lawyers. Um, often the lawyers are provided through charity and, and not everyone gets one. Um, one of, the, one of the biggest things that I found by interviewing a lot of people and talking to Freedom From Torture is that there's so much shame attached to some of the things that happen in, at home that often when the refugees first arrive in the country that, you know, where they're seeking asylum, they feel this rush of safety. But then they also feel that they don't have to own up to that story anymore. They can maybe make up another one because the story they actually lived is so very, very shameful that they don't want it to be attached to them in their new life. This happens to a lot of LGBTQ people um, who, you know, escape because of, you know, persecution at home, but, um, but they don't feel willing in an asylum interview to actually to confess to that, and so they say something else. This is exactly the case of what happened with Hushyar, um, and why he wasn't willing to say it. Uh, later, by the way, in that in that excerpt, I go into the into some more of his reasoning, and he was mourning over the fact that he didn't say it at first, and that um, because he had said he's a Christian when he first entered the country, that would now have to be his story. He would now have to make that story stick. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of shame around identity. There's also an issue of self-awareness. So if you convert to a religion in the West, there's a particular process that we all go through. I mean, we live secular lives, right? So if we go through the trouble of converting to a religion, it's part of some kind of internal process. And usually we have access to that internal process, right? I mean, we can say, well, I became disillusioned with this or that. I read a lot of books. I went to some church meetings. I thought about X, Y, Z. And, um, and this is how I came to be a Christian. We usually can say something semi-coherent about it, but that's a very Western thing. Uh, what I've seen, um, even when I was a child, among the Christians, the underground Christians in Iran, is that the process is nothing like that. You've lived a very, very unhappy life, and somebody shows you a moment of joy, and you cling to that, and you believe with your whole heart, and that belief is nowhere near, um, I mean, um, how do I say, it's no less valid, it's no less true. Um, but it's not, um, it's not easily explained or described. It's explained in one sentence. It is, I just believed. I just love Jesus. I just believe that Islam is too violent for me, you know? And they can't go beyond that. And another reason is because they couldn't actually describe these things when they were in Iran. You say one of those sentences in Iran and you could get yourself killed, right? So there's not a lot of self-knowledge in things like apostasy. Um, a, a very strange thing that I found was there's also this very bizarre thing that happens with the Persian calendar, but it's just an example of the many uh, discrepancies that come up just simply because you're, you're dealing with foreign documents. So um, one of the people that I spoke to, one of the lawyers said, okay, so in the Persian calendar, and I actually know this to be true, the new year starts on the spring equinox, so March 21st, right? 
But the day of the leap, the, the leap day happens, at, we, we, we do it on February 29th, right? They do it at the end of the year. That means it happens on March 20th. Okay. That means every, every leap year for 20 days between February 29th and March 20th, what happens? Everyone's birthday that was born in that time is a day off, right? There have been cases that have been turned away because it was a leap year, someone translated their birthday wrong, and they said, you don't even know your own birthday. And there's, that's just one of hundreds of inconsistencies. Um, another thing that makes them not believable is trauma. I had a really wonderful little lesson on how memory works from a doctor at Freedom From Torture. And she said that when we're going through a traumatic experience, there's two parts of the brain that make memory in general, right? But when we're going through a trauma, the amygdala goes into high performance mode. Now, amygdala is responsible for sensory information like tastes and sounds and all the five senses. So that stuff becomes super sharp. So the smell of the grass, the color of the grass, the white van sitting just there. On the other hand, the hippocampus, which is responsible for contextual information, goes into high contrast mode. So the hippocampus stops storing contextual information that is considered, I guess, too small. So for example, you start to forget dates. You know, you'd ask trauma victims, refugees, what day was it? How many hours passed? What was the name of the street? Um, you know, who were you with just before? Uh, what did everybody say? Those things are really very hard to remember because the hippocampus is in high contrast. I remember uh, Christine Blasey Ford, um, who's, who uh, testified, um, uh, against uh, Judge Kavanaugh, and, and she said that that particular memory was, um, what, is it, what did she say, in, indelible in the hippocampus? And that's what she meant. It was the one piece of contextual information, the attacker's identity, that went into high contrast mode. Everything around it, like how many steps there were, and where the house was, and all of that stuff would of course disappear because it's not the big contextual information. Unfortunately, asylum officers are taught to pretty much only ask for the contextual information. So they ask for the street name and the name and the day of the week and what time it was, and they take inconsistencies in the time of day even, and they use it against you in court. Um, there was once actually in the US, one lawyer told me that they became suspicious of one of her clients because he remembered the color of the car so vividly and he repeated it three times. That's actually why I put the graphic of the white van there. He remembered the white van and the judge said, so there were five guys beating you and you remember a white van? I don't believe that. And so his case was dismissed. And, and according to doctors, that is exactly what would happen. Um, then there's the fact that a lot of trafficking victims have already been basically branded, not just physically like that one, but psychologically with a set of things to protect their traffickers. There's one trafficker who told his victim, if you break your oath to me, your heart will race, you will grow hot and sweaty, you will have memories of me, and that is how you will know that you're about to die. Um, of course, he is describing the symptoms of PTSD, and every time she started to tell her story, that's exactly what happened, and it was a self-fulfilling prophecy, it just continued to happen more and more, and she believed she would die, she refused to say his name. They often threatened the women's children at home, other members of their family. So when women come in, um, and they seek asylum, and they won't name their trafficker or the brute, well, they're not believed. Then there's culture. Um, I love that picture right there. That's a, a very famous Iranian storyteller. But storytelling is incredibly cultural. In fact, how we make memory is incre incredibly cultural. Um, just like religion and how we, how we show our faith is cultural. Um, there was a lawyer who said to me, Iranians have an enormous amount of time to tell a story. They'll never answer a question with yes or no. It's always a long story. And what's more, he said, <laughs> um, they don't ever start in the middle of the story, right? And they don't, they don't start where you, know, you think you should begin. Um, they don't even start at the beginning of their own lives. They often start at the birth of modern Iran or the beginning of the universe. <laughs> and I thought about that for a while and actually it's true, every time I hear Iranians tell a story, they start way before they need to. And then I thought about why that might be. 
And um, I remember that when we learn stories when we're little children, every sto story begins with a rhyme. And even well into adulthood, we kind of jokingly start our stories with this little rhyme. And the rhyme goes, Yeki bud, yeki nabud, as khuda hishkas nabud, which means there was one and one person wasn't, except for God, there was no one. Okay? That's the beginning of the universe, right? There was one person and there was no one else, right? And of course there was God. So that's, that's kind of the, the, the origin story, I suppose. Um, and if everyone's starting with that at the beginning of every story since they were a child, um, how do you teach them that the Westerner needs you to start with the action or cut to the chase, as they say? Um, Iranians don't know how to cut to the chase. Um, so, so there's culture. Um, and by the way, the cultural stuff also affects what you're willing to say. Often, uh, women from Middle Eastern countries are just plopped down in front of a man and told to describe what happened to them. Well, they're not going to. They're not going to tell a man stories of sexual abuse. They're not going to tell even about problems in you know, any kind of personal home context. So then there is the interview itself. Um, Freedom from Torture told me about how um, the process of the interview often re-traumatizes torture victims because many of them have been interrogated in the past extensively and it was the interrogation that led to the torture. I talked to some of the torture survivors myself and they describe all of this detail about just being driven from you know, the home office, one part of the home office to another part and just to have the interview. And they describe it like this dark movie, like they're going to their death. When they're in that car, they believe they're going to their death and they're just going to have their interview. To them, it doesn't feel that way. You know, it feels very much like the previous interrogations. But another thing that happens, and I talk about this in the book a lot, is hysteria. So the absurd thing about the asylum process is that we make them wait for so very long, right? And what happens if you make someone wait for this undefined amount of time? You know, you don't, you don't say, oh, well, sit there for five minutes, or you don't say, you know, you're going to be waiting for a year. You tell them, oh, it could be tomorrow, it could be the next day, it could be any time, and then you make them wait a year. Well, that will drive them absolutely mad, right? And people have this, this hysteria, this desperation to um, continue on with their lives, to know, you know, they just want an answer. Um, Roland Barthes wrote this wonderful piece of lover's discourse about waiting and how waiting can drive you, you know, mad. And he describes, you know, the waiting of the lover, you know, and how the lover sits there and everything just becomes, um, you know, more and less of, of the physical and, and how, um, you know, it becomes melodramatic, unable to be, you know, just normal. And of course, that is the thing in fiction that we are taught makes you the least believable. Melodramatic fiction, melodramatic prose is not believable. It is false. It strikes false, right? But of course, we drive the asylum seekers to melodrama and then we interview them. So I met this man who I call the refugee whisperer, and there's a really lovely, flattering photo of him. And he has given up his entire life to translating Western culture for Iranians and Afghans, for Iranian speak, Farsi speaking refugees in the Netherlands. And he tells them, there are three things that you need to understand. You need to know yourself, you need to know your field of battle, but you need to know your opponent most of all. And this is the way that most of, of, of these asylum cases fail. You don't really understand who it is that you're talking to. The wonderful thing about him is that you know, he's not a translator of language, he's a translator of culture, and he helps people translate themselves. And he has had such bizarre, bizarre moments, and everybody knows about him. When I was in Amsterdam, like 10 different people pushed his number into my hand, including lawyers and undocumented immigrants, and just people who said, this guy will help you. I found out that when, he, uh, when there's people who are threatening to jump into the canals to commit suicide, the first person the Dutch call, if the person is a Farsi speaker, is this guy, Ahmad Puri. And he told me a story once about how um, there was an Iranian man and he was about to commit suicide, he was about to jump into, the, into a canal. And um, there was a lot of police out there, they'd been waiting for many hours, and he rushed to the scene, and he went and talked to the guy. And he said, what do you want? And he said, you know, I, I'm exhausted. I just wanted to, I just want a life. I just want to keep on living. I, um, and, and now I'm tired and I want to come back down. So he looked at him, he's like, but you can't come back down. And he said, why? And he said, because these are, 
the Dutch, this isn't Iran where you can just change your mind after six hours and everyone gets a cup of tea. If you don't have demands, you've just embarrassed them. They're going to throw you in jail. And he said, but all I want to do is come down. And he's like, we're going to need to come up with some demands from you. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is all happening in Farsi. So the guy's like, I, I, I don't have demands. And he's like, trust me, it will be better for you if we take 10 minutes right now and come up with a few demands. Just let's make them small ones. So in Farsi, they crafted three or four demands that the police immediately met, and then they thanked him profusely, and they sent the guy back. <laughs> um, but the thing that Ahmed Puri told me is that the, uh, the thing to know, and the thing he always says about the asylum officer, is that the asylum officer is cynical and overworked, and he's not listening for the truth. He's looking for a single lie, just one lie, one contradiction, so that he can send you away. Um, he told a story about uh, an, a conversation that he had overheard in the asylum offices in the Netherlands. And this was in the canteen of the asylum offices. There were two caseworkers talking to each other. And one of them said, um, you know, today I turned away. And he, he literally said this. This guy just basically swore to me that he said this. He said, um, today I turned away a real and true political dissident. Okay? I listened and I listened and I listened. And after three hours, I had him. I found the contradiction. And the other guy said, congratulations. And they went on with their lunch. Neither one process that they said a real and true political dissident. So this is a group that has forgotten the humanitarian part of their job and believes that their job is basically just to catch inconsistencies. I'm going to show you something that really, really shocked me when I saw it, but I promise you that this has been triple checked and verified by every professional at Freedom From Torture. Um, they often talk about the, the culture of disbelief, you know, the fact that in the asylum offices they are incentivized to turn people away and they're even, you know, they have secret quotas that have been verified by many people. Uh, you know, they're trained to be hostile. There's a lawyer that I met who a couple of years ago had a case that was rejected and she didn't understand why. So she paid the 10 pounds and requested all of the public papers because those papers are accessible to the public, the file is accessible, and often the Home Office goes through and redacts whatever comments they don't want shared, but they, they share all of the transcripts of the interviews and they send them to the lawyers if you pay the 10, 10, 10 quid, 10 pounds. So she paid the 10 pounds and she requested the files and they had forgotten to redact some of the comments that were on, that, that the interviewer had written. So I'm gonna read these to you because it's hard to read. But the question here is, were you frightened? Yes. Why were you frightened? Because I did not know why he called me. Why did you go, you idiot? So this is the comment of the, uh, the interviewer, right? Up there, can you speak English a little bit? Can you speak Senegalese? I don't know. How stupid is this guy? Can you read English? Yes. So the answer here, it says, it says, no, applicant is crying for one minute, loser. The guy says, I think about my children. He says, you wouldn't have to if you go back to Sri Lanka. Okay, this is the audience. I still can't believe. <laughs> okay, I a couple of weeks ago spoke to a home office presenting officer under condition of anonymity. She used to work there you know, a couple of years ago and um, she has since left and works for a charity and so she was willing to be very candid with me about her thinking during the time that she worked there. I asked her, what was your job? What was your job description? She said, to draw, to draw out inconsistencies. That's our job. We have to prove that they're lying. I pressed her on this, I said, are you sure that was your entire job? And she said, that was our training. Then she said, some hopos, hopo is home improvement, uh, home, home office, <laughs> home office presenting officer, will be very pedantic. Oh, you said 6 p.m. here and 7 p.m. there. If you get a hard judge, they'll love it if you go to town on those tiny discrepancies. And then she talked about how in her own neighborhood, there's a lot of sham marriages that are happening. Men from Afghanistan and Pakistan marrying women from Poland and Lithuania. So when she got these individuals in her interview room or, or in one of their case files, she said, I knew the questions to ask. I know that they're lying. Many of these guys aren't the brightest. They get stuck in their own web of lies. 
So then the question that that presented for me is, if she feels so very confident that she can tell who the liars are, are there human lie detectors? Are there people who can really tell? Um, a lot of people say that there's signs and, and there's you know, ways that you can know. And in fact, they have videos all over YouTube of how you can know if someone's lying. But research has basically shown that most people are no better at detecting lies than chance or flipping a coin. That's from the American Psychological Association. There's a former FBI agent who said that he had jurors who would say, oh, they heard somewhere that someone's lying if they touch their nose or whatever. You know, and of course, this is not a real thing, but they would use that in their deliberations. Uh, and then this doctor at Freedom From Torture told me, and same actually was written by Joan Navarro, even interrogators trained in microfacial expressions don't reach far about, above 60%. And yet caseworkers have been known often to say, I can know by looking in their eyes. So this year, I'm going to do some digging. I'm going to look for some stories. The KV case has, has me absolutely riveted, and I'm, I, I want to get deep, deep into that story. But I want a few more from other areas of life. What are the situations that make people disbelieve? What are the kinds of people that are disbelieved? Um, and what are the kinds of stories? For example, I found one about the wrongfully accused. A friend of mine from college works with the Innocence Project, the Mid-Atlantic Innocence Project. And these two brothers were recently quitted after spending 25 years in jail for murder, um, a conspiracy to commit a murder. And uh, basically, they were put in jail based on a paid witness he, he, who claimed to have seen the crime from a third floor window 150 feet away, and a 13-year-old boy who immediately um, recanted. And he recanted again at trial, and, and, and he wasn't believed. So these guys spent 25%, uh, 25 years in jail because of that, and that's them the day that they were set free. That's my friend. So proud of her. <laughs> Um, so what she said is that often admissions of guilt are readily believed, but you know, um, pleas of innocence are dismissed out of hand because we believe that it's human nature not to want to plead guilty. Of course, there's a lot of reasons why you would plead guilty. Um, another thing that happens is that police often form a theory very, very quickly and then immediately start bucketing information. Here's information that fits, here's information that doesn't fit. All of the information that fits gets believed, the information that doesn't fit gets disbelieved. I want to look into stories about women, you know, who are not believed. There's this very famous story that won a Pulitzer. I'm sure you guys have heard of it because there's a television show or a Netflix show on it now um, about a girl who claimed to have been raped and the police basically badgered her into taking back the story into saying that it ha she had made it up. She was in such a vulnerable place and um, I suppose the rape was so surreal and so traumatic that she quickly said that she had made it up. And then, of course, it was found to be true when the rapist was apprehended and there were pictures of her in his, on his hard drive. Um, so I want to kind of pivot to why some people are systematically believed. Because here's another thing that really interests me um, and makes me really angry because I went to business school. Um, so, <laughs> somebody's laughing in the back. Yeah, you're going to laugh a lot now. Hold on. Um, so, in business school, I, I, I mean, I don't want to say that we learned how to lie, but we learned how to lie. There's a quote from this girl, um, who, the, the, the rape case that I just showed you. She says kind of casually at the, um, you know, in, in, in one of the transcripts, I wish I had lied earlier and better, right? So, you know, what she meant by that was that all of the, you know, all of the moments where she had been called a liar, when she had been disbelieved, had happened because she had been inconsistent. It hadn't been because she told, you know, something false. It was simply because she had been inconsistent with her earlier self, right? So, in business school, what happened there? Oh, yeah. Um, essentially, what we were told is that it doesn't really matter what is true. The only thing that matters is what you can prove, right? And actually, it doesn't even matter what you can prove, only what people believe. And actually, it doesn't matter what's believable, only what is possible. And so really, all you have to do is make them believe in the possibility of you. What can you accomplish? 
so, you know, essentially there was this codification to the idea of truth. Like, what, what is truth? You get to decide what is truth because you are in the privileged place um, where you get access to truth, to credibility, to believability. You just have to know how to signal it, how to say nothing, essentially, and be believed. One of the things we were taught, and I found a graphic about, of, of this, is like, for example, when you make a claim, if you make a claim with a graphic, people will believe it at a statistically significant amount more than if you don't have a graphic, even if it's false. I don't know if that, that claim is right, actually. I have absolutely no clue. But the one on the left is more believable than the one on the right, which is why I have so many pictures in this presentation. <laughs> um, we, we learned that it helps to argue against yourself at the start. If you go in trying to get something from someone else, you begin by arguing against yourself, talking about all the reasons they shouldn't go for what you're selling. They taught us to ar organize our arguments in a messy way, that's mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive way. They taught us how to make other people sell to us. They taught us to use our girly voices in a one-time negotiation so we can be underestimated, and then use our man voices in performance reviews. They taught us to make, ima to make that images make data believable. They taught us that precision implies accuracy. 60% is less believable than 63%, so don't round to 60, round to 61 if you can. They taught us mosaic theory. This one I'll explain in another, in another slide, but it is a way basically to get out of insider trading. That vague statements can't be refuted, but precise statements won't be refuted. They taught us to understand BATNA. Do you know what a BATNA is? It's the best alternative to a negotiated agreement on the other side. And ZOPA is the zone of potential agreement. And so if you know that, you can win a negotiation. They taught us when not to be yourself. They taught us to label every single concession that you make. Make sure the other person hears that label. And to, of course, you've heard this under promise and over deliver. Here's a, a, a professor at Harvard Business School who in a um, program called Women Rising, the Unseen Barriers for Women in the Workplace, talked about all the moments where you actually have to try out behaviors that are quite unnatural to you. She said that when you're in a situation that requires you to be effective in ways that don't come naturally, you can't solve that by being yourself. You have to learn to be someone else. And, and then, of course, she teaches you how. how who knows who this is? <laughs> Nobody else? OK, so and there's a few enough people that I get to tell this amazing story. Um, so that's Elizabeth Holmes. Elizabeth Holmes was once the youngest self-made billionaire in the world. And she started this company called Theranos. What she's holding there is what's called a nanotainer, which is a tiny little tube um, that holds a few droplets of blood. And she claimed that she had invented a technology where from a few drops of blood from the fingertip, she could test for all of these diseases, basically making it no longer necessary to take the tubes and tubes of blood from the arm, which is you know, so very invasive. And then of course it took weeks to test. So guess what happened when she went looking for funding? By the way, she was a Stanford dropout, and she was 19 years old. So she went looking for funding. Do you think people gave her money? They gave her hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. And do you think they did this after testing, or testing the product and looking at the business plan and the financials? Nope, they didn't look at any of that. Here's what they looked at. She already had some people with sterling reputations that were on her board. They said, oh, surely, these guys wouldn't associate themselves with anything that was remotely questionable. She had David Boyce, which was basically the most notorious and renowned lawyer in America, uh, on her board, and nothing can be off at a company where America's most famous lawyer is guarding the shop. Of course, they didn't think that a giant fraud could be perpetuated by a woman, and of course, they believed, most fundamentally, that if you have a bold vision, then you're exempt from the, all the rules of society because you're a bold entrepreneur with a cool idea. So they gave her all of this room. 
It turned out, of course, that she didn't have a product. She basically thought she could fake it till she made it. Unfortunately, it's really, really hard to make this science fiction-y sort of thing, <laughs> you know, um, just with a couple of hundred million dollars. People tried very, very hard and they failed. There was all kinds of, um, um, you know, there were just all kinds of glitches in the process and she really just hadn't done what she said she had done. Now, should, should all of these people who gave her money have known? Well, she gave an interview to The New Yorker. Um, the New Yorker's Ken Aletta basically uh, you know, called her out, but he didn't really say much. This was in a, in, a, uh, in a report that he did that was pretty favorable to her, but he did say that her description of her business was really comically vague. But what she said was about how her, her uh, invention worked was that a chemistry is performed so that a chemical reaction occurs and generates a signal from the chemical interaction with the sample, which is translated into a result, which is then reviewed by certified laboratory personnel. And she also added that thanks to miniaturization and automation, we're able to handle tiny samples. To Fortune, she said, that the whole thing is about optimizing the chemistry and leveraging software. So she said absolutely nothing, and people gave her hundreds of millions. Um, so I wanted to just very quickly, before I move on to how, uh, I guess, how people learn to get away with this, because I don't think it's something that happens overnight, to talk a little bit um, about what some of the ways are that we all lie, that we, that I found actually my students lie a lot, um, you know, my, my students in college and, and, and high school, um, which is really where all of this starts. Lying with metaphors and hyperbole and melodrama, that's how most of us lie. I think that the biggest lie associated with the refugee crisis is terms like deluge and swarm and flood. Um, you know, when you take the number of refugees that are coming through, um, you know, for like in comparison to the population each year, um, terms like deluge and flood are, are patently inaccurate. Um, there was a story about um, a theme park that uh, where one of the roller coasters basically um, you know gave out and people died and when the CEO was interviewed he called the problems with the roller coaster teething problems I thought it was really interesting that he used that phrase I mean for one he was obviously trying to make it seem smaller but he was trying to sound make it sound childlike he was trying to make it sound organic instead of what it was, which was machinery that was not well maintained. Um, he was lying, of course. At McKinsey, no one ever got fired. People got counseled out. <laughs> because counseling is kind. It was, of course, a lie. Mosaic theory, I'll tell you what that is now. So hmm, uh, about 10, 15 years ago, there was a huge SEC scandal where, you know, um, group of people who had been getting very, very close to insider trading were um, indicted for insider trading. And a lot of them gave the defense of mosaic theory, which is the idea that they didn't sit down with one analyst and pump him for information that they shouldn't have had and then trade on that. That instead, they gleaned a lot of different small pieces of information from many people. And they put it together in a mosaic that kind of was able to give them an image. And they were, they were barely able to see that image, but they saw it. And that's how they traded. Of course, that wasn't true. They did sit down with the analyst and pump him for information. Um, the last thing I'll say is, I think a lot of us lie in small benign ways, in small well-meaning ways. Um, I'm programmed, I suppose, to be suspicious of my business school classmates. But, <laughs> but um, a couple of... I guess now a couple of years ago, um, a business school classmate of mine died. And somebody sent an email to the whole group saying that he had died. And as I was trying to think of what to say to him, emails started flooding in. And it seemed as though basically brunchers around the world were beyond devastated. Everybody was replying all. Everybody was saying things like, I, this is the worst possible thing, and I can't imagine anything worse. When they hadn't chosen to speak for that to that guy for 10 years. I think we often lie with melodrama and hysteria um, when we don't want to admit our real feelings, which are most often nothing. 
Um, Orwell says that we lie with language. He says that the great enemy of clear language is insincerity. When there's a gap between one's real and one's declared aims, one turns, as it were, instinctively to long words and exhausted idioms like a cuttlefish spurting out ink. I saw one of my students walking around with a handy list to make her essays better. She had gotten this off of the internet. The list included the following phrases to include in your papers in order for them to be better. As a result of, in addition to, the importance of, the significance of, for the most part, perhaps, and according to some. So, I mean, I tore up the paper and told her to start over. But this is exactly what, what um, Orwell is talking about when he talks about lying with prefabricated phrases. He says that most modern writing is basically gummed together and, and, the, mix, and the results made presentable by sheer humbug, which, I, by the way, I love that I get to say sheer humbug in public. Um, and basically, it's designed to give the appearance of solidity to pure wind. Um, the, the reason I put this up here is because I think that this is how people learn to lie when they're 18. Um, and then when they're 28, they end up in business school and learn how to say a chemical reaction occurs and then there's some results and, have her, and be so confident that she is utterly believed. And of course, we always do this. Um, or we all do this, I mean. Uh, Orwell says that debased language is very convenient, a continuous temptation, a packet of aspirins always at one's elbow. So I wanted to show you, and I don't want to belabor this point because you've all seen the ugly ways that people write, right? I mean, there's a lot of people who've taught students in this room, but this is a real sentence that one of my students turned in. Somebody want to read it out loud? Please. Will you read it out loud? Yeah. Because I need a rest for my voice. This semester in class, we read Sherman Alexie's excellent short story, What You Pawn I Will Redeem, a narrative that concerns itself, first and foremost, with the plight of those thrown into a state of limbo with regard to house and home, whether that be by the mandates and difficulties of society or by their own lack of drive and skill. Thus, the story shows that the details of the situation in which the protagonist lives in order to give the reader a sense of the day-to-day -day experience of this limbo, which is, one must note, a matter of political importance. So this, this was an 18-year-old with some of the very best education, um, and, and he wrote this. So we started to cut it, and at the end we came up with Sherman Alexie's What You Pawn, I Will Redeem is a short story about homelessness. So, I mean, that is the truth of that sentence, right? But I, these kids are so very conditioned to lie about how much they know. Um, and they're conditioned at a very young age, and that's why they're believable. I think these are the believable people. Um, I, taught, I teach my kids that truth is basically point of view plus the five senses, but also a listener, a listener who wants to believe. Um, this is why, I guess, earlier I read a little something about um, why sometimes fiction is better. You know, why I use autofiction so much to try to show a manifested truth. Um, because fiction is about the five senses, um, and it's limited by the five senses. You don't get to comment on things. You actually just have to show them. You have to manifest them. In a world of nonfiction, in a real world, we can actually ask ourselves, could this be self-inflicted? Because the trouble with this is that all we see are scars, right? In real life, there's always another possibility. There is another bucket that we can make, right? In fiction, though, we are primed to believe. It's art. We want to believe. If you basically describe, uh, you know, if, if you write the short story of what happened and we read it as a short story, it will be believed because there's no risk to believing. And that brings me to the problem of need. At the beginning, I mentioned the problem of need. Which stories do we believe? We believe these stories. A couple of days ago, uh, 39 people were found dead in the back of an Essex lorry. Right? Um, we know about Alan Curdy, the three-year-old who was basically who was found um, on a beach. We know about the bodies of Oscar Alberto Martinez Ramirez and his 23-month-old um, daughter who were found on the Rio Grande. Like these are people who no longer need anything from us, and so we take their stories, we believe it, we eulogize them, um, we believe them because the dead don't want anything. Um, I want to close by saying 
that another thing that fiction gives us, I suppose, which is why I think I will return to it, is that a lot of truth is sealed beyond all access. No story contains all of the truth, and no story is ever complete. The story of these 39 people will be locked in the back of that lorry forever. There's a poem I wanted to close with. It's called Written in Pencil in the Sealed Railway Car. Um, it goes, here in this car load, I am Eve, with Abel my son. If you see my other son, Cain, son of man, tell him that I. It's a circular poem. It goes back to the beginning, but it's also one that's not finished. It's not finished, and there's a lot of truth that it will never contain. And so I think this is why refugees turn to art. This is why that little boy drew the crane. This is why I prefer auto fiction. Um, because art is believed. Your audience isn't looking for inconsistency. They're enjoying the orphan details. Art is manifested. It's about the five senses. It's sensory. All that sensory information is contained in the amygdala, right? Um, all of the survivors of freedom from torture are very good at creative writing. They don't remember the context. They can make up the context. They remember all the beautiful sensory details that make a story great. Then they make up the context. Con context because it's art. And that's another thing. Art is infinitely accessible. There are parts of the truth that we can never access in real life, but if we're allowed a little bit of room to move into the imagination, it is infinitely accessible. What time is it? Okay, I'm not going to show you these videos, but later, if you want to, I can show you some videos of Elizabeth Holmes talking and moments where she was believed a moment where she was actually asked, how do you make people believe you? It's creepy. And then I, there, I have a video of some um, refugees telling their stories. But if you're interested, come. I'll show them to you. I'll open it up for questions now if anybody has any. Oh, wait. Hold on, you guys. Wait, 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 wait. I have a funny thing. So. They, we had a thing in business school um, for making fun of these people like Elizabeth Holmes, who had no strategy. It was the underwear gnomes. Phase one, collect underpants. Phase two, question mark. Phase three, profit. <laughs> anyway, any questions? It's late, but I think it would be nice to have, some, uh, to have a bit of discussion from people, yes. so, so please. Um, thank you. It was absolutely uh, powerful and beautiful and impressive and important. And I think you are raising uh, questions and issues that really connect so many different stories. And uh, as many people in that room, I was reading like fragments of my autobiography <laughs> in what you were saying. And uh, I think it's, it's extremely important. That's what a great work is, when everybody can relate and can really engage uh, with, with what you're saying. So thank you. It was, I am a little bit moved, so it's very oh, difficult. Thank you, Edward. That is so <laughs> No, no, kind. you were <laughs> very, very beautiful and powerful. And um, I, was, I was wondering in, if in your project uh, you, you also asked the question of the potential uh, effects of being believed or not. I mean, like, if people believe you, uh, will it force them to act on something? You know, you can believe the story of a migrant, of a migrant, for example, in an ideal world. But w will it push people to do something, to act, to take action? To and and is there like a, a, a field of, of of thinking around these yeah. these issues? And um, maybe yes. So I thought about the question of involvement. You know, because it's so hard to believe, just because you have an incentive system around you, but you never have to see that person again. It's already so hard to believe for those people. So, but what if like there was a there was something you were asked to believe that immediately involved you, you know, where you then had to take some kind of action? I I have thought about this and I couldn't think of a case, but I want to find a story like that because the thing about this project is that I don't want to go into this kind of talk the way I did for my book, right? Uh, last one. I I want to just tell the stories. So I would love it if I were to find one in which the listener. You know, it, it isn't just the reader. There is an actual listener who might have to take some kind of action afterwards and then be involved. It's kind of a, a, a sort of a Good Samaritan uh, question, right? Like, w what if I stop? I mean, I can see the truth of this 
this thing that's happening, but that will take up the rest of my day or the rest of my year or whatever, you know? Um, it, something like that happened to me. And I actually saw all of the human frailty just within myself. Um, I, I volunteer uh, with refugees a lot, and there was one that I was asked to befriend um, in whose situation was very much like my mother's. She was in London, she was a, a um, you know, she came from a medical field, she was incredibly depressed. She had two children who were around the same age I was when I came to um, America, and I just loved the little girl, and she just reminded me of me. But the woman who wanted to be my friend, she reminded me a little bit too much of the, the version of my mother that was too painful to accept, you know? Um, and the more I accepted her story, the more I had to get involved because what she wanted was my friendship. The, the more I did not want to be involved in this, you know, like everything inside me was saying to run. And so I, I started to take note of my own thought processes. I was making a lot of very interesting excuses. <laughs> You know, at one point I got like a, I, I started to go, go into like moments of paranoia. I got this uh, phone call from Iran and there's many, many reasons I would get phone calls from Iran, but it was from a, an, an Iranian agency. And I very quickly hung up and I told my partner, well, she's given my number to an Iranian agency. We must now end this relationship. And he said, okay, well, that's your crazy talking, <laughs> you know, um, but I, I mean, I think there's a lot of things that we do psychologically to try not to be involved. So I, yeah, I'd love to find a story like that. And if I don't, I may have to actually tell that story <laughs> in the book. Yes. Thank you so much. That was fascinating and so well told. Um, I have just a, clarifi a clarifica clarification question when you were talking about the business school strategies. Yes. Um, the first one was argue against yourself at the beginning. Can you explain more how that works and how that fits into a, ref a potential refugee narrative? Um, well, arguing about, um, against yourself kind of fits in with that whole thing that my friend the lawyer said about how people who admit guilt are immediately believed, but people who uh, profess innocence are not believed, right? So because this is so in human nature, right? Uh, I mean, this was in a business school context. So they said, you know, you very immediately say... Um, things like, well, you shouldn't buy this product or you shouldn't invest if, you know? This is not for people who, you know? Like, um, because then it makes you look as though you don't need them and you're very, very, I suppose, ethical and high-minded about who you want um, to be involved in your company. In the case of a refugee, that's when people come in and say something like, um, which is often the truth and it was the truth in our lives, that life was happy. You know, I don't want to be here. It is not the dream to go to the UK. It is not the dream to go to the US. Um, I was a doctor, I was a craftsman, I was a tailor, I had my own shop. It, life was beautiful, but then there was a war, you know, and then, oh, but then I had to become a Christian, but then I was found out, you know, um, and I had to run for my life. And that's a really crucial part of the story because it fits very well into the definition of a refugee. A refugee was forced to flee, was forcibly displaced based on one of those five, um, five definitions. So it was that sort of training, the training to know that if you tell the person, I don't wanna be in your country, right? That will make them want you, right? Where a refugee is often, is often poor, is often from an Eastern country. I talk a lot about shame and not just shame over things that have happened to us, but cultural shame. From the East, we have so much cultural shame. We're so tra trained to bow in front of the Westerner, right? Do you think that it's in people's instinct to go up to them and be like, I don't want to be here. I want to be home, but I'm in danger. And so now you have to take me. No, they say things like, oh, we love your country, we love the West, we're not, we're not like incubating terrorists. You know, we, we love America, we love the UK. Um, and that will work against you because it will make you sound like you want them too much, you are an economic migrant. Do you see? So there's, I found that a lot of the refugees who had training and education were incredibly successful because they knew when to work against themselves. There's a story in my book about uh, a man that I met who arrived, I think, about 12 years ago or so in the back of a lorry to the UK. He arrived, he lived in Kurdistan and he had worked for KDPI, which was the Kurdish Democratic People's um, something. Um, so he, he was, it was, it was a, a rebel group, a Kurdish rebel group. And he was in trouble with the Iranian government and he escaped and he made his way to the UK and he arrived in the back of, the, of, of, of a lorry. By 12, 14 years later, 
um, all the dates are correct in my book. <laughs> um, he was one of the top immigration lawyers in the UK. So I went and met with him and he told me his whole story and how, um, you know, how he knew what to say. And he said that somehow instinctively he understood that he had to confess to all of his crimes. He had to say to the, to the immigration officer that spies from the Iranian government came, they threatened my life, then they gave me money to be a spy for them. I took that money and I spent it on myself with no intention to return it. Then I did not give them what they wanted and I ran, right? Most people would say, why would I confess to all that? That's so shady, right? But if you were shady, you were probably in trouble, so that's reason to help you. The reason he had that instinct is because he was the archivist at this, this Kurdish uh, you know, People's Party. Right? And he had read all of the works of the founders. He had archived all of the writings and all of the stories. He had read so many stories that it had sunk in who gets believed and why. Right? So it's not just about business school just so overtly giving you these little nuggets of bullshit. Right? It's, it's just about a lifetime of education, of understanding how to be believed, starting from those terrible sentences that apparently people on the SAT board really believe, you know? Back to Louis. Because uh, what, what you are actually uh, saying is that the, those institutions, they don't, re they don't really care about truth, in mm -hmm. fact. They mm -hmm. are asking for a certain storytelling, and they are expecting a certain storytelling. And in fact, the question of truth and, uh, or not is, not is not really a matter for them. They almost ask people, it's better, they, they ask more people to lie in order to give, to deliver the good storytelling yes. than the truth itself. Well, by those organizations, do you mean the refugee ones or it, the educational ones? The, the, the ones that are uh, able to welcome or to reject the migrants. Ye yes. And so, yes. so from, from that start, starting point, don't you think that uh, 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 truth could could be a, a, a political program of resistance, considering the fact that these people don't care about truth. Absolutely. And from that question, what 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 could be the problem with fiction? In fact, because aren't we reproducing the same thing yeah. when we say the importance in storytelling? Aren't you? Uh, uh, sorry, I'm very moved, so I have yes. uh, trouble uh, to speak in English tonight. But uh, um, uh, you know, like if the, those institutions were violent and racist and rejecting people and rejecting women when women testify about mm -hmm. sexual assault and everything, if if they focus on the storytelling and they don't care about truth, yes. don't you think we speak the same language than them when we support fiction? And we well, it's it's really a, a naive yeah. and, and complicated question it's that compli I'm asking it is, myself. It isn't naive at all. It is complicated though, and. I think, let me just start with the first part. Like, can it be political if they don't really care? Absolutely, because um, first of all, it's not so much stories that they're after. It is a box ticking exercise for them, right? Um, often, and you hear a lot of immigra immigration lawyers say this, they say, we believe that your life is in danger. We believe you're telling the truth. It's just not one of these five reasons, right? Um, that itself shows a level of kind of shutting down, a disconnect between um, the humanitarian mission of the Geneva Convention and all of our humanitarian duty, right? And the actual like bureaucratic, um, I guess, intricacies of getting someone through, right? Um, they believe in the boxes that they're ticking. And that's all they're looking to do. They're looking to kind of finish that off. So, so in terms of like, how is this political? I think in so many ways, I, I mean, I think that we need to kind of, um, we need to look at the Geneva Convention in a different way and not allow individual countries, individual administrations to interpret it anew again and again and again, right? And, and that's a massive international cooperative uh, effort that has to be, um, it has to start, you know, politically with people like that. Um, and then in terms of fiction and nonfiction, I don't know. I, I don't. I don't agree with what you said about you know. Well, and let me try to understand it because I think that what they're looking for in terms of storytelling isn't 
the way we're trained to tell stories in fiction. It's actually completely the opposite. They're asking for you to, to fit your life into a formula, you see? And that's the very opposite of what we're taught to do in fiction, right? In fiction, we're taught to put all of these beautiful orphan details into our story. We're taught not to end it in a clean place, right? We're taught to say something original and completely new. If you come to an asylum office with a completely new story, they won't believe you because there's no precedent. So you are actually asked to tell a story that's already been told, but not told too much, right? You're, you have to fit into this very interesting, like very narrow middle ground where your story has been told enough that they know it happens, but the details are slightly new enough that they know it happened to you, right? And they can't be any of those absurdities that actually do happen once in any given life, right? Um, so, so I think that what you end up with, the result, the resulting story that comes up, comes out, is tiresome, you know, and it's boring, and um, it's unrecognizable, and it's made for a bunch of bureaucratic papers and nothing else. Whereas what we are trying to create with fiction is the recreation of a life on paper, with all of its you know, beauties and believabilities and all of those things. So I actually think that to write those stories and to, to get them in the hands of people in maybe another moment in their life is the way to fight this. That um, asylum officer that I spoke with, yeah, the reason that she didn't believe is because she had seen people behave a certain way in her own neighborhood, right? But she was a well-read woman. She was someone who was open to fiction, you know? She actually to told a story about once how um, she had some Afghan ancestry herself, and she actually helped a couple be believed because they were told they didn't have enough evidence of their courtship in Afghanistan. And she explained that, no, no, any evidence would get them killed. Of course they wouldn't have evidence. And she helped those people because she knew the details of life there. So imagine if that woman was armed with stories, right? And just knew how things are, really. You know, and that's what fiction does. So, yeah. I was actually talking about the whole thing. I love the way you presented um, uh, this comparison with, you know, reducing it to lies and truth and yeah. need to lie and belief and all that. I thought it was a really original way to present something. Thank you. And then I, I it's interesting when you brought up the whole poem there at the end, because I was wondering, how on earth did you find her? Oh. Like, did you have any huge regrets about all that you did? Yeah. She said, one of, there's a very moving thing she said after she told me that story about helping that couple be believed. She said, um, I would go home at night and tell myself that it's okay that I work in the home office because only I can do something like that. Um, and then she said, there was another thing that she did. She said that when there were um, cases that she knew had been decided wrong and they would come into her hands, she knew that she couldn't go back to the original caseworker and ask them to change their mind because that caseworker had quotas and there's no way the caseworker would change their mind. She said, so I would lie down on cases. You know, I would kind of get this excitement from knowing that I could win this and I'm just going to lie down. You know, and I thought, wow, I mean, to, to, to overcome the instinct to do well at your job, it, it's harder than you think, you know, like to make yourself seem like an incompetent lawyer and the defense lawyers will go to drinks that night and be like, well, that, that woman didn't know what to do when you did know what to do, right? It's, it's quite brave. And I think that's the reason she spoke to me. She was, there are people like that in the home office and there are people like that in the US too. Thank you, everyone.